How long would I last using only a junk scope? You know, the guys in the club thought it would be amusing to put me through this, so okay, let's give it a try. I went out and bought one of these things, and it's pretty bad. It's, is this the worst thing you can buy? Of course, there's always something worse, but I think because there are so many of these things out there, people have brought these to my attention. I know some of you have written in to say that people have brought these to you at Star Parties. I think because there are so many of them out there, we might say on a weighted average, this might be one of the worst things you could possibly buy. And it has all of the hallmarks of a junk scope. Chief of them is that it does not advertise itself based on its aperture. All good telescopes, the ones you can actually use, advertise themselves with the aperture first. All bad telescopes advertise themselves by their magnification. In this case, 288 power. Oh my goodness. Okay, so here's the ground rules. I must make a reasonable attempt to use this and only this telescope for the duration of the test. Number two, if something prevents me from using it for any reason, I am allowed to make a reasonable modification to it to get it operational. And number three, I'm gonna try to go a month. I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna make it, but let's check it out. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this thing. You'll see some variants on this model. It doesn't make much difference. You see what we are greeted with is a lot of plastic with the instruction manual here. And we have inside what is the most useful item and the only useful item in this whole thing, the planisphere. So these work for finding out what's up in the sky. It's sort of a quick peek. You've got the date on the outside and the time on the inside. And then you just dial this up and you get a quick peek as to what's on here. It's not a great planisphere. I think this is a little crowded and hard to read, but you can use this if you want to. This one also came with one in French. Unfortunately, things go downhill from here. Got a typical piece of plastic here. And this is listed as a 50 millimeter, 600 millimeter focal length, which would make this a 50 millimeter F12. The mount here is of course a non-standard mount, so you're gonna have some difficulty putting this on a regular mount. The focuser is already starting to fail on me. As you see here, it's a piece of plastic and this knob is already loose. Try not to turn that too quickly or else you're going to strip the threads. This is the tripod. Rest of this is pretty much what you're used to seeing, but I'll point out a couple of things here. This is listed as a 6x25 finder, but as you may be able to see, it's stopped down quite a bit. It's not actually 25 millimeters. We've got a 1x erecting eyepiece. Oh boy, this is bound to be really bad. And we have two eyepieces here. One is 18 millimeters and one is nine millimeters. Of course, 0.965 inches. If you are new to this, any time you see an eyepiece diameter less than one inch on an inexpensive telescope, this isn't automatic sign of junk. And most 18 millimeter eyepieces you see are gonna be a lot more comfortable in this thing. The nine, of course, is going to be useless. Look how tiny that is. The field of view is also always gonna be really bad. So for reference, the good eyepiece is an inch and a quarter standard. So this is a 17 millimeter. It's pretty close to the 18 millimeter. And you can see the difference in the size of the optics there. This one's gonna be a lot more comfortable to use. And this is not a great eyepiece by itself. But the strangest thing in this whole package is this. It is a Barlow. And those of you who follow me know I'm always a cautioning people against the indiscriminate use of the Barlow because beginners like these because they will extend the magnification and of course magnification is very often the enemy especially of uh, cheap optics but this one is look at that it is a 4.3 Barlow lens that is not a misprint oh my goodness okay so here we are it's a typical anti-telescope you've seen this sort of thing before if you know your scopes, you know what the problem is. It's rarely the optical tube. It is, of course, the mount that causes you all of your issues. And this is one of the worst ones I've ever seen. It's got to hold that steady. I mean, multiply that by however the magnification is. And by the way, the way they get to 288 power is they put the nine millimeter eyepiece and the 4.3 Barlow. If you do the math, yeah, that'll get you to 288 power. Good luck with that. I didn't even try that, and in fact, I didn't even try the 9mm eyepiece. I knew it would be worthless. 
The lowest power you can get out of this thing is with the 18 millimeter eyepiece at 33 power, and even then it's still, it's still too much. This actually does have an azimuth lock knob on it, but whether you have the lock on or, or off, it doesn't matter if the lock is essentially still on like this. Moving this thing in less than five or 10 degree increments is impossible. And the most frustrating thing is, if you get something in the field of view that's sort of at the edge, forget about it. You're not gonna center it. The thing you have to do is to move the telescope all the way away and then move it back and then hope that you get there. It is infuriating. I spent, I don't know how much time and I eventually did see Vega. It was dim, it did not look good and I was glad when it was over. My hatred for the mount is equaled only by my hatred for the finder. This thing is absolutely useless. And in fact, the mount won't even hold the thing steady at 33 power. It won't even hold the thing steady at six power for the finder. I had better luck just picking up the whole thing and holding it with my hands looking through the finder. My hands were steadier than the mount. So I don't know what to say here. I mean, I have nothing to work with. It, it's a zero, I, I can't use it. So I don't know, maybe I'll try modifying it. Okay, so let me show you what I've done here to try to make this thing usable. I've had to do these things, otherwise couldn't see anything through it. So this mounting system here is just awful. So I have done this taped thing with a Vixen compatible dovetail plate on there. That is a temporary thing. Put a red dot finder at one end. This finder here is beyond awful. This is the most evil thing I think I've seen in a long time. If you were gonna try to use this thing yourself, what I would do is just pull the optics out of it and use it as a sight tube. But the way it is, I mean, it's just terrible stuff. Uh, these knobs here are already starting to fall off. I'm gonna have to get some adhesive and put that back on. If this is a plastic focuser, as you might suspect. 0.965 inch diagonal and an 18 millimeter eyepiece. These things are useless as well. So uh, this is a hybrid diagonal that I have. It's 0.965 inches at one end, and at the other end it has an inch and a quarter so that I can put a, uh, it looks like it's a Celestron generic colossal on there. So at least now I have some sort of hope of seeing something through this telescope. So let's take this back outside, and boy, we're, we're styling here, aren't we? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, the girls are really gonna wanna hang out with me when they see this. So here we are outside with the scope on the Vixen Porta mount. At least the thing will hold still. I'm not sure how much of an improvement that is because the views through this thing are still really bad. But at least we can hold still and track the stars as they go across the sky. This telescope will just barely split Mizar with this 25 millimeter eyepiece. It will just barely split Alberio and it won't do much else. We spent an exhaustive half hour or so searching for M3, the globular cluster, which should be within reach of a 50 millimeter telescope. And we finally did see something fuzzy show up, but just barely in the eyepiece. It was then that one of us noticed that the views were a lot dimmer than you might expect for a 50 millimeter telescope. Now, 50 millimeters doesn't gather a lot of light, but we should be able to see more than that. And I ran a quick experiment. These are Celestron 7x35 binoculars. These are 35 millimeter aperture, and these things were way brighter than the images in this telescope. So something's going on here. In the daytime, we looked back down the tube, and we didn't notice this before, but look at this. There's a field stop about halfway down the tube. I don't have the patience to figure out how much light that's cutting off, but that's in there. That is an old trick that cheap telescope manufacturers will do to make the images look sharper. You cut off the outer edge of the aperture, and you just use the center part of the lens. It's going to look a little bit sharper, and of course, it's going to cut off a lot of the light, and it's going to be a lot dimmer. So if you look down the tube, you'll see those six sharp protrusions actually bite into the side of the inside of the tube. So it's in there really, really tightly. And it took a while for me to figure out how to get that thing out of there. But luckily, I used my scientific instruments that I got out of my toolbox. These are otherwise known as a screwdriver and a rubber mallet. And after pounding away at it for a few minutes, it did come out. Here it is. Go figure, this is the one part of the telescope that is well made. Okay, so with that out of there, we have a full 50 millimeters of aperture, nothing stopped down. Let's look through it again. 
And I did this and I'll tell you, <laughs> looking even in the daytime, you can see that at least half, half of the field of view is completely blurry. You can't see anything. Looking at it at night, it's impossible to find anything because you think you're finding an object like a star cluster or a nebula or something, but it's actually distortion on the outside. So it, it's even arguably even worse than it was before, but given how hard it is to get this thing in here, I have, this thing's probably out permanently, so this thing's in a permanent state the way it is right now. Yes, I know what you're saying. The average buyer of this thing is never going to split double stars or look at globular clusters with it. But hey, it's my test. I'm going to look at whatever I want to look at. But I do concede the average buyer of this thing is probably going to be looking at two objects, the moon and the neighbor's house. So I did both of those things. The moon is awful. There is glare and mushy white stuff all over the place. There's chromatic aberration, and it was hard to draw a fine focus on anything that I was looking at. Same thing with a house in the daytime. The outer edges were just mushy and hard to draw a focus on. I think you're much better off just getting a pair of binoculars. And that's my piece of advice for anybody looking at a junk scope. Get a pair of 7x35 or 7x50 binoculars instead. Okay, so what's next for this thing? I think I'm going to go ahead and put it on the cellophane swap table for a dollar and see if any of you might want this thing. If nobody wants it, I'll probably just take it straight to the transfer station. And the final tally, I lasted a grand total of 10 days. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.